how do we do looks like we have a nice crowd with us today welcome everyone i'm really curious we don't do a lot of events at momath at noon in the middle of the work day in the weekday so if you are joining us and you wouldn't mind typing in the chat whether this is a good time for you and is it because you're in another time zone is it because you're on your lunch break is it because you're retired we'd love to know if this is a great time to be doing programs going forward Anyway, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Cindy. I'm the director of MoMAP. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to today's exciting event. Before we get started, I wanna tell you that we have lots of events going on in the museum in case you don't know, or in case you're new to us. We're not even done with all of our events today. At two o'clock, we've got Magic Squares. That's for adults only. We call it a senior session, but all adults are welcome. Later in the day, we've got programs both in the museum and online for students, grades three through eight. We've got Mobius Madness online and Tide and Knot Theory taking place in the museum this afternoon. We also have a program for little ones at four o'clock. It's called Math Play. If you have little ones in your life, please let them know about the program. And then I'm very pleased to tell you about a special program we're running tonight called Simplified. This is going to be a recurring annual lecture in memory of Peter Carr, who was a museum trustee who was well known for taking very complicated topics and making them easy to understand. He moved seamlessly between the worlds of academia and finance, which is a very unusual place to be sitting in the middle of those two disciplines. We lost him all too soon and we're really looking forward to tonight's event called a Nobel Prize with Elementary Math. Kevin Addison will be explaining to us the Black-Scholes model of option pricing in a way that we can all understand even without advanced math in Peter's memory. So I hope you'll join us for that tonight. Um, that's not the end of the week though. On Thursday, we've got breaking codes online for fifth through eighth graders. On Friday, we've got a student session online called Discovering Polyominoes for children in grades kindergarten through three. In the museum on Friday at 4.15, we've got another Mobius Madness for third through sixth graders. And then Folding Fridays. Every Friday, we start our weekend off with some folding fun. Many more things are going on in the museum as well. I'll just call out one in particular. December 10th is our birthday party. We are turning 10 years old. There will be new and exciting things being released in the museum all day, as well as a party in the evening. If you're at all close enough to New York City to come, I hope you'll consider joining us us for the evening celebration of our 10th birthday. With all of that, it is now my pleasure to turn the Zoom mic over to Dr. Moira Dillon. She's an assistant professor of psychology at NYU, and she directs something called the Lab for the Developing Mind. In her lab, Molly studies the origins and development of human intelligence, and she focuses a bit on the mathematical domain, and hence we've been working with her at this point since 2017. It's been a wonderful partnership and Molly is very luckily uh, an early career award winner. That's an award from the National Science Foundation. And that has allowed her to bring all kinds of new programming to MoMath, including this Minds on Math talk series. So please join me in welcoming Molly Dillon. Thanks, Cindy. Uh, today, I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Stanislas Dehan as our Minds on Math speaker. So currently a professor and chair of experimental cognitive psychology au Collège de France, Stan is also the director of the INSERM Cognitive Neuroimaging Unit, Neurospin. Stan's work focuses on the fundamental cognitive capacities that give rise to our uniquely human intelligence, including consciousness, reason, mathematics, and literacy. Stan's work merges cognitive neuroscience, experimental psychology, computational neuroscience, computational cognitive modeling, cross-cultural research, and cross-species research, creating a truly unmatched methodological toolbox with which to study the origins, development, and flourishing of the human mind and brain. Stan has received prestigious accolades for his work, too numerous to list here, but I note in particular that he's a recipient of the James S. McDonald Foundation Centennial Fellowship, the Grand Prix Scientifique de la Fondation Louis D. de l'Institut de France, the Brain Prize, the David E. Rummelhart Prize for Contributions to the Theoretical Foundations of Human Cognition. Stan is also the author of several popular books, including in their English titles, Reading in the Brain, Consciousness in the Brain, How We Learn, and his seminal work, The Number Sense. So as you can see, Stan is one of the most engaged thinkers in the cognitive and neural sciences. But 
Those of us who also know Stan from the Latin American School for Education, Cognitive, and Neural Sciences can attest that he's also one of the most engaged salsa dancers on the dance floor. <laughs> I've always suspected that this is the reason his lab is called Neurospin, or at least I intend to start that rumor this afternoon. <laughs> so just for some uh, logistics for today's talk, after I pass the mic over to Stan, you'll see uh, an attendance survey pop up on your screen with two questions. Please submit the survey at your earliest convenience. We invite you to keep your video on during the presentation, but please remain muted and reserve your questions to the end of the talk, at which point you may raise your hand and I'll call on you to unmute yourself. We're able to extend the question period to a quarter even past a uh, half past the hour. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Stan. Thank you so much, Molly. It's a great pleasure. I, I wish I could be with you in New York. Uh, unfortunately, you know, I'm in the French time zone. And so uh, um, I'm speaking at six in the evening. Um, so um, let me start by sharing my slides. Um, oh, wait. I need to remember to share the sound. This will just take one second. Yes. OK. Here we go. I hope you can see the full screen. Great. Okay, great. So, um, yes, I, I would like to tell you tonight about research that we've been performing in the past uh, five to 10 years, trying to understand um, what's special about this brain, the human brain whether it is in an adult or in fact in an infant, the human brain has extraordinarily superior capacities to learn and to abstract from what it has learned uh, compared to, let's say, its uh, non-human primate relatives like the macaque brain here. And um, tonight I would like to tell you about inquiries into the mathematical brain. What's special that allows us to acquire mathematics? I am so impressed um, by uh, what humanity has been producing. Um, 20,000 years ago, approximately, people entered the Lascaux cave and they made these beautiful paintings of animals, which are also, in a certain sense, geometrical. You see, they're abstracted away from the shape of the animal, but they also make perfectly uh, abstract shapes, like this rectangle or these lines of dots. And we see this all over the world in all sorts of cultures, spirals, circles of stone. Notice that the circle here is only abstract. You can only see it from above. So the people who built it must have had the idea of a circle uh, before they built it without ever seeing the result of an actual circle. Um, this capacity for geometrical symbols is extremely ancient. We see, for instance, this piece of ochre, um, one of the oldest from Homo sapiens from uh, South Africa. And you see this network of parallel lines forming equilateral triangles, which undoubtedly is geometrical in nature. But uh, there is already a zigzag uh, 540,000 years ago uh, from Homo erectus. Uh, it's not even sapiens. And we might debate whether these bifaces that have two planes of symmetries are spheroids, which can be as ancient as almost two million years ago, um, already betray a sense of symmetry and geometry. And yet, we also find that the sense of geometry um, explodes in its diversity um, in recent uh, human cultures. Uh, we see, for instance, here in the Chartres Cathedral, all this diversity of geometrical shapes and how they can be combined in sort of graphic language. And yet, at the same time, there is a very frequent cross-cultural convergence towards the same basic shapes. For instance, the shape of the maze is a very familiar thing across cultures. And we see it, of course, in ancient Greece with the Minotaur. We see it in the Chartres Cathedral. In fact, almost the same exact maze is found in the Dolomites in the north of Italy in Paleolithic cultures or prehistoric cultures. Um, so there is something to explain here. Why do we have this propensity for geometry and how can we explain it? And I will be using geometry as one example of what I think is the real secret of the human species, the ability to develop symbols and languages. We have this capacity to combine symbols together to form intricate sentences, phrases that express um, concepts in written and spoken communication, but also mathematical concepts, and in some cases, just uh, expressions of a syntax in music. 
Um, and this is also very, very ancient. There was a culture of flutes 30, 32,000 years ago in, in the middle of Europe. So um, today we'll concentrate on mathematics, but bear in mind that the idea is that this is an illustration of something very peculiar and perhaps unique to the human mind. And we'll be testing that by comparing with monkeys, um, the ability to assign symbols and combine them to form languages. And I, I claim that this is the heart of mathematics. So this is the plan of my talk. I'll be talking about the language of geometry, the ability to combine concepts of geometry, which we see, of course, in the seminal work by uh, Euclidus. Um, I will start by asking why is geometry a univer human universal by showing that there are precursors in non-human primates. There is proto-mathematical competence uh, in uh, people with reduced access to the education. So there is a starting platform of uh, proto-mathematical concepts. But my claim will be that we recycle these concepts and we recombine them together in order to create higher mathematics. And I will illustrate that in the domain of geometrical sequences with some brain imaging evidence for where in the brain this is taking place. And also I will be telling you about geometrical shapes and why even the mere perception of a square is already enough to say, well, there is something unique about the human brain here. So I will try to claim that even shape perception, the perception of a square or rectangle or parallelogram requires the postulation of a language of thought. So I'll start with the foundation. This is uh, Molly enough. When Molly was kind enough to mention my, my first book, The Number Sense, which appeared almost 30 years ago now, but there's a new edition. The idea is that um, there are very ancient non-linguistic foundations to mathematics. Um, and number is one of them. There is core knowledge of number, but there's also a sense of space, a sense of shape that we share with many, many animal species. And that therefore is a sort of common foundation that we extracted from evolution. Basically, we evolved in a world in which it's useful to have concepts of number and space. So in the case of number, we have exquisite data already from a few years ago. Uh, for instance, the work of Andreas Nieder shows that in the monkey brain, you will find neurons that care about number. And you can see some of these neurons on the right. You find some neurons that prefer to see one item on the screen, some neurons that prefer to see two, some neurons that prefer to see three or four or five. And this means that there is already a pretty abstract sense of numerosity, the approximate number of a set of objects in non-human primates. And we share the same representation. I'm showing you all data here, but there is even more recent data suggesting that very much in the same region, which is inside the parietal lobe, so somewhere here in both hemispheres, um, non-human primates as well as humans have a representation of approximate number. When we see a set of objects, we know how many items there are, and there's a little map in the parietal cortex with number one, number two, number three, occupying slightly different neural populations. Um, it's not just uh, evidence from comparison of human and non-human primates. It's also what happens when you don't have formal mathematical education. For many years, uh, my team, together with Pierre Pica and uh, Elizabeth Spelke and Veronique Isa, we've been studying uh, people from the Amazon, like uh, these uh, Munduruku uh, people. And uh, the Munduruku are interesting because they don't have formal education in mathematics, and they have not even invented counting. So they have a restricted lexicon of number words. Um, you can see here that they have a word for one, which they use when there is one object. They have a word for two, which they use when there is two objects, a word for three, a word for four. But when there is more than four objects, you see that the curve collapses and they begin to use the word for one hand or one handful. Uh, um, and uh, they have words for few and for many. That's about it. They don't count. They don't recite these words. They don't have formal arithmetic. And yet, when we tested them, we were able to show in many different tests that they are able to uh, compute with these approximate numbers. Even for numbers that are much larger than the one for which they have names, they can still decide whether the sum of two sets is smaller or larger than another set. And so they understand intuitively the concepts of combining sets, the approximate numerosity that it makes, and the ability to compare with another item. They don't have exact calculations, so they fail in a task where you see five dots, 
four come out and they have to decide that there's only one left in the box. They cannot do that exactly, but they can do that approximately. So approximation and number sense are one of the foundations that are present even in the absence of formal education. Um, we also studied a lot the sense of geometry, the topic of my talk today. And I just want to state very briefly that essentially all of the basics of geometry uh, can be found in these people. We test that with very simple displays where, for instance, all of the items are squares and one of them is a non-square, it's a rectangle, or, and you have to spot the intruder. So you can see all of these intruder uh, displays here. Each, each, each one is tested just once. And yet uh, the people do way better than chance on any of them, um, suggesting that they have concepts of parallel lines, equal sides, right angles, that they're able to bring to this task, even though it's a completely novel task for them. So foundations of uh, number and space uh, are present in animals, they are present in us humans, because we inherit from evolution um, these basic concepts. Now, how do we do formal mathematics with that? Um, this is uh, the idea of neuronal recycling, which I've been proposing and I try to flesh out in my experiments. It's illustrated by this sort of joke or caricature here, Darwin on the body of a monkey. Um, but uh, there is a certain truth to that. Um, what happens with our education in humans is that we repurpose or recycle the pre-organized neural circuits that we inherit from our evolution. So our brain contains ancient circuits, but the ability to learn is in part the ability to repurpose or recycle these circuits, to reorient them. And um, whenever there is a cultural invention, such as reading or number, uh, it means that there is in fact a neuronal niche in the brain. There's a circuit that is close enough to the function and plastic enough that it can be reconverted. So again, the prime example of that um, is uh, symbolic arithmetic. I could give a whole other talk on how we learn to read. And again, we recycle brain areas, but um, let's concentrate on mathematics and uh, arithmetic. Suppose you do a very simple calculation um, with number symbols, something that the Munduruku could not do, like five minus four, 13 minus four. Um, well, when you do that, you still use the same circuits or very similar circuits to those of the monkey brain. And um, you only access the circuits with symbols. And the symbols allow you to have much more precise thoughts. And the symbols also allow you to combine items together to think thoughts like 10 plus 3, 13. So concepts are being refined by the symbols, and also they are being combined together. So I claim that this is really what's happening with mathematics. We start with this foundation, but we somehow build a whole pyramid of uh, new concepts um, by recombining through symbolic thought and language uh, the original ones. So um, there was a very simple prediction of this idea. And this is the first experiment from the lab I would like to show you, is that even if we were able to scan professional mathematicians, maybe there are some in the audience today, uh, we would still find the same sort of circuits. They would have been recycled for very high level mathematical thinking. So this is what we did with Maria Malric uh, a few years ago. Uh, we um, managed to convince 15 professional mathematicians of pretty high standing uh, to come to Neurospin and be scanned in fMRI um, uh, while they were doing some high level mathematics. One difficulty, and I, I say that a little bit in joking, is what is the control for a professional mathematician, right? In the end, we decided also to scan professors of humanities uh, without uh, mathematics, uh, but of so-called matched academic standing. Um, it's not clear what this means, except that they were all professors and they all had roughly the same salaries. Uh, but um, it's a comparison of people who know mathematics versus people who don't know uh, much mathematics. Um, now, the other question is, what task do you make them do in the scanner? We had them listen to a sentence and decide whether the sentence was true or false. And some of the sentences bore on mathematics and some um, were about uh, facts of general knowledge about the world or historical knowledge. So I'm going to test you now. I hope you can hear my sentences and see if you think this is true or false. Oops. There is no non-vanishing continuous tangent vector field on even dimensional spheres. So true or false? 
<laughs> it's not easy, right? Because this is really meant for professional mathematicians. Notice that there is no mention of number. It's all about very abstract concepts. This sentence is actually true. Uh, it's about uh, how a sphere cannot be fully covered by a continuous uh, field. By It's like combing your hair is impossible if it's a perfect sphere. Um, any square matrix is equivalent to a permutation matrix. True or false? <laughs> this is a little bit easier. It's actually false. Uh, but you see the difficulty, right? And so we have mathematicians thinking about it. All we're asking them is for an intuitive judgment of true or false. And they were about 75% correct. We also had some control statements. So here's one. In ancient Greece, a citizen who couldn't pay his debt was made a slave. So here you have to bring together all of your knowledge of, of Greece, of slavery, history, and uh, maybe you decide this is true. It actually seems to be true. Okay. We don't care so much about the truth or falsehood. We care about your thinking and whether you're activating the same areas for these uh, different activities. We also had the subjects uh, calculate, and we also presented them all of these pictures. And you see that some of these pictures include numbers or equations. So we were interested in what activates in the brain when they see this. I will not present you the full, full result, but just one striking result. There is a network in the brain that activates when you listen and judge mathematical sentences, which will not activate if you uh, think about other things than math, um, such as history, uh, for instance, the ancient Greece. So you see this network in colors here in the brain uh, to just to get you oriented. This is the front of the brain. This is the back of the brain seen from the side. The eyes would be around here. So this is the parietal cortex uh, on both sides. You can see that both sides here, the temporal cortex and the frontal cortex in specific regions. And you can see, you know, during the statement, there's not much activity. And suddenly at the end, when you begin to judge it, there's a huge amount of activity arising for all of the sentences that speak about math. And there is no such activation for the sentences that don't speak about math. And it's not just one directional um, network that would activate for effort, because there is also the converse network. So the one I showed you is in blue here on this slide. This is the mass network in blue, um, or mass responsive network. Um, but conversely, the sentences that speak about general semantic knowledge activated the, the network in green, which is much more familiar uh, to brain images. It's so-called semantic network that you activate when you think about the meanings of words and sentences. It involves the anterior temporal region and posterior temporal regions here and some frontal midline activity. So you see this double dissociation. We really do not activate the same network when we think about mass and when we think about something else. And um, it's very clearly due to mass education. So here we have people listening to the same statements. The mathematicians show this very clear activation to mass, but the control subjects do not. And they remain essentially agnostic about this, uh, this stimuli. So what is this network? Uh, here I'm showing you in yellow uh, this network which is also shown in orange on the left and right of the slide. This is what happens when professional mathematicians uh, do high level mathematics. But um, it would be wrong to think that they are the only ones to have this network. We all have this network. We all have a mass network. In fact, it's the same that would be activated in all of us if we were doing recognition of numbers, just flashing of numbers on the screen, or if we are doing mental arithmetic, like five minus four. In all of these situations, you see the same sort of network lighting up. And so the, the yellow network here is the intersection. So in a sense, this is exactly uh, compatible with this idea of recycling. When we do high-level mathematics, we reactivate a network that we all possess and probably possess right from the start, maybe right when we are babies, which deals initially with number and uh, with geometry and then gets more and more refined and abstract as we learn higher mathematics. And very importantly, it's not the same network as spoken or written language. On this slide, you see one slice uh, through the left hemisphere. So we see very clearly the very classical brain network for language. I think many of you know that the left hemisphere in most of us is interested in language. And also uh, this is Broca's area in the frontal lobe. And this is the temporal regions that are extended for language processing. But you see how different the mass network is. This mass responsive network, um, even though mass is a language, is really occupying very different set of sites in the brain. 
So that's one thing to remember from this talk is when we do mathematics, we really activate a mental language, which is not the same as classical natural language. So um, we, maybe I'll skip this one in the test of time. What, what we wanted uh, to do uh, next in the lab was really to try to narrow it down to what is the basics of this language of mathematics? Can we show how the sense of geometry emerges from the capacity to combine basic concepts? And um, uh, instead of going further higher up to a higher level mathematics, we were trying to find tasks that even a preschooler could run. And that would show that in fact, these networks are already getting organized in the form of a language of mathematics. So we came up with this task. Uh, you see here the very display that we showed to preschoolers and, and to first graders, and where there is uh, eight possible locations, you see that they are organized in a sort of octagon on a circle. And um, we ask a very, very simple task. You're going to see a little fish hiding in all of these ponds. Um, can you uh, guess where the fish is going to go next? It's going to move around. Can you guess where it's going to go? So let me test you now with one trial. Okay, I hope you saw this five locations. And the question is, do you know where it's going to go next? And uh, it's a trick question everybody knows. It's going to go here, it's going to go here, it's going to go here. Now, what did you do? You did something incredibly abstract. I mean, this is really one half of a trial learning, right? You didn't get the full trial but you are already able to anticipate because you notice the regularity of the sequence. And so this is what this test is about. Uh, it's about finding that um, even preschoolers, and we also tested uneducated people, again, uh, from the Amazon and also uh, from uh, Namibia, um, we all have the idea of structures, geometrical structures, that uh, we immediately perceive in this sort of situation. And it's not trivial. So this is the zigzag that I was just showing you. Um, how should we understand the zigzag? Well, we need, you need a sense of symmetry along an axis, such as the vertical axis, so horizontal symmetry, if you like. And you also need the idea that you start again the same symmetry from different starting points. So we did a lot of studies of this situation with many different sequences that you see on the top right here. And we decided that um, on the basis of experimental data, that the only way to account for what humans are doing here is to assume that they are in fact a little program in the head. The pro sorry, the program, the program for the zigzag is something like I need to repeat four times that I will repeat twice the symmetry operation while I change the starting point by one. And this is my zigzag. So when we see a zigzag on the shell in Java from 500,000 years ago, um, well, we are right to think that there is something very special and very unique to humans about here. It's already a, the, the trace of a language. So I will not burden you with all of the proof that we have that there is something true about this idea of a mental language. Basically, we did behavior. We did a functional MRI to look at the brain circuits. We used another technique called MEG, magnetoencephalography, to look at the parsing of the sequence. And all of these data converges to say, well, um, the uh, complexity of the mental language predicts the complexity of the memory on the part of the subject. Can they memorize the sequence? Or of the anticipation, what you see here is the amount of anticipations that subjects could make of the next points. And uh, this anticipation index reflects the complexity of the underlying sequence. How easy is it to encode in this language? Um, if I do, if I go back one slide, perhaps we had this irregular sequence here. Why is it irregular? Because there is no way to compress it and to encode it in this language of thought. So uh, the key idea here is that if your brain can compress it in the form of this internal language, you can memorize it and predict the next. If you can't, then uh, you are going to be stuck. And because these are, these are eight items, it's too large. It's, it's exceeding your working memory. So you will not be able to remember it. 
And in fMRI, we found that the same sort of parieto frontal dorsal network that we found for mathematics is already activated by these geometrical sequences. So when you see a geometrical sequence, when you understand a zigzag, you're already performing a sort of minimal uh, mathematical operation, which involves combining concepts in your head, having a little formula, a sort of mental program with four loops that allows you to encode uh, this basic idea of the zigzag. But it's the same for two arcs or for two squares or diagonals. All of these concepts um, can be combined together into this elementary language. Um, one very important thing, again, this language, even though it's a real language of geometry, does not overlap with natural language. So in red, you see the areas that are being activated when you listen to speech or when you read a story or read a sentence, and they do not, do not overlap. Um, with the areas in yellow that are activated by this language of geometry. If, however, we ask whether there is overlap between geometry and calculation, yes, it's a huge overlap. It's very much the same areas. We need to continue this study to see whether it's exactly the same neural circuits, but by and large, it's the same uh, overlapping areas. And um, can I uh, prove that this is really something peculiar to humans? Uh, do monkeys have the same sort of abilities? What's wonderful about this geometrical task is that uh, it's easy enough for the rudiments of it to be taught to a monkey. So here is um, in the lab of Li Ping Wang in Shanghai, my collaborator, um, a monkey performing something similar to what you just saw. He's reproducing a sequence. And in fact, in this particular example, he's even reproducing the sequence backwards. So. On each trial, I hope you can see that there are three locations that are being simulated, and uh, the monkey is very quickly touching the screen in the opposite order. Um, this is now a length four trial. Even for length four, this particular monkey was able to do it. Most trials were correct. I hope you can see the tac, tac, tac. He is touching uh, in the opposite order. So. Um, this is nice because the monkey is able to do the basics of the task. He's able to remember a spatial sequence and uh, he's able to reproduce it from memory. So we can test the monkey's memory for sequences and whether it's similar to humans. But the answer is that it's very different. First of all, as you can see, um, um, these sequences are much shorter than uh, what we tested in humans. We could not go beyond four with monkeys. We could go all the way to eight or more in humans because humans have this ability to pick up the regularities, which monkeys did not seem to do. Monkeys were much slower. It took tens of thousands of trials before they could do this thing that I told you a preschooler could do in just a few trials, just one trial. And there is no evidence that it can learn very complex grammars or geometrical structures. Maybe I'll go quickly with that, but it seems obvious to you that all of these patterns on the top um, actually belong to the same pattern. It's turning around the circle of locations. Um, so uh, this is one of the simplest possible sequences for humans because it just involves going around the circle. It does not matter whether you start here or there, whether you turn clockwise or counterclockwise. We all treat this as the same. Um, and likewise, there are many, each time there are 12 patterns, there are 12 instances uh, for a particular pattern in geometry. But what we found was that uh, monkeys have enormous variability within these patterns. So for them, it's not at all the same, all of these 12 sequences. Some are easy and some are hard, and there's this enormous variability. Whereas for humans, it's exactly the opposite. There is variability across the different patterns. And if you see this diagram here, we've sorted the 30 possible patterns that you can make out of these sequences of four. And uh, you can see that both for adults and for children, for instance, this sequence of going around the circle is the easiest. And there is a reproducible ordering, a partially reproducible ordering of which sequences are easy and which are hard. Monkeys could not care less. Monkeys have no idea of the geometrical structures in this task. They remember the four locations. They seem to have slots for remembering each of these four locations, but they don't create a notion of structures. And they don't care whether it's a simple structure or a more complex structure, like crossing of these, of these items and so on. Um, so this completely flat curve here for the monkey suggests that they really do not pay attention to the transitions and to the geometrical organization of the patterns. 
And I'll come back to that with more evidence a bit later. But so remember, humans seem to have a language of geometry. Uh, monkeys don't. Um, recognized very famous piece of movement. The prelude in C major to the well-tempered clavier uh, by Bach. Um, why am I showing you this? Because one of the questions we wanted to ask is whether the same sort of language could explain musical structures. Yeah, you, just a glance at this uh, sheet of music shows that music is a sort of geometrical tapestry over time and frequency, not so much over space. But you can see in the partition uh, these um, structures that you can hear in the prelude. Uh, they are almost like a zigzag, right? I hope you can see these zigzags. This is the writing uh, by Bach himself. Um, so we wondered whether we could have the same exact language explain some sort of musical sequences. Now, I'm sorry to say that we did not really study real music, but we studied, again, abstract sequences that are a little bit like music. So um, I hope that uh, Bach will forgive me, uh, but these are the stimuli that uh, we had our subject listen. See if you can remember, if you have a feeling that you could remember this sequence or reproduce it. Do you remember it? It's a 16 item sequence. So it's 16 is way beyond your normal working memory, but you can remember it more or less because there is structure. Listen to this one. I bet you could repeat it. Now, how about this one? You feel overwhelmed, right? This is because here there is no structure whatsoever. It's like my most irregular geometrical sequence. I'll play it again, see if you can remember it. So these are all of these sequences that you've seen. And basically we have the same sense of regularity based on the very same sort of language for geometry. And I'll cut a long story short, but we found that the very same language that accounts for our memory for visual spatial sequences without any change can predict the subjective and also the objective complexity of a binary auditory sequence. So for instance, what you've heard when this was this sequence, we, it's essentially, again, a set of nested loops in a sort of language of thought, similar to a computer language. It says there's a first pair, and then it repeats with the other sound, and then there's an alternation of four, and then the whole thing repeats. You need three structures to explain these things. You need nestings. You need a language uh, with a sort of grammar, a bit similar to what Chomsky has been proposing for natural language, uh, with three structures inside three structures in a recursive manner. But the interesting point is that it's the same sort of grammar that we have for this sort of elementary music and for uh, the sense of geometry that I was showing you in the spatial sequences before. We found that the same sort of brain structures are activated, especially in the parietal region, in the intraparietal sulcus again. Of course, in one case, it's vision. In the other case, it's auditory. So we do find differences in the initial sensory inputs. But at the abstract level, it's very likely that they are very similar structures. And this, of course, raises the very interesting question of whether mathematicians share uh, some abstract structures with musicians, whether you can transfer from one to the other. Maybe we can address that in the discussion period. Um, in the last part of my talk, I just want to tell you that we are also trying to generalize these ideas to something which has nothing to do with sequences. So it doesn't look like a language to start with, but just the ability to perceive a shape, a perceive a quadrilateral shape. So uh, let me test you again. Um, suppose uh, you are a young child and you see this for the first time and your only task is to touch the shape, which is different. Did you spot it? All right, very easy, right? Let's try another. Which shape is different? Maybe a little bit harder. And how about this one? Which shape is different? Very hard, right? Well, this is the whole point. So we tested all of these shapes, which you can see on the screen right now. And believe it or not, there is the same amount of change in each of these shapes uh, that I showed you before. We just display one point uh, displaced in a different location. It can be one of these four locations here. 
but we always displace the, the dot by the same amount. So um, uh, in a certain sense, on the screen itself, it should not be more difficult to detect this displacement. And that's what we ask our subject. Can you pick the outlier? Uh, it's this intruder shape. But you can see that some shapes are very regular, like the rectangle or the square. They have right angles, equal sides, uh, equal uh, angles. And we progressively remove all of these properties until we get to the most irregular shape, which has no geometrical property that is special. And this has been our finding. There is again a huge effect of regularity. Just like for sequences or for music, things that are regular are much, much easier to pick up. So it's very, very easy to pick up uh, an outlier among squares or rectangles. It's much, much more difficult to pick up outliers uh, among uh, irregular shapes. And you see this sort of very continuous regularity effect here. And we found it also when we reverse the role of the deviant and uh, of the standard shape. And you can see in this slide, we claim that this is a human universal because we find it in all sorts of experiments. We don't have to present the whole shape. We can just present its corners in a sequence format. And so this is bridging between the first part of my talk where I was talking about sequences versus this part where I'm talking just about seeing the shape on the screen. It really seems to be the same sort of regularity. Um, we find it uh, in preschoolers here. It's not as spectacular, but you see that the square and the rectangle are there. And even within those other shapes, there's still a regularity effect. We also find it if we go test people in Namibia who don't have formal geometry, don't have formal education, whose housing and so on does not have very strong regular shapes, but they still have this notion of a geometrical shape. So this is a very good test of the sense of geometry in humans. You see, it's a huge effect, by the way. It's very easy, almost 0% errors here, but all, all the way to 40% or 45% errors for the, for the regular shape. So it's a huge effect. And this allows us to ask, is there a sense of geometry in non-human primates again? Could we have exactly the same test in non-human primates? Would they show also a sense of geometry? Or is this really about a language that allows us to combine properties to perceive a square as a set of um, uh, you know, four sides that are equal and four, four equal angles? Um, so uh, we decided to test that, and we are very lucky to collaborate with Joël Fago, a colleague in the south of France who has a colony of baboons. And um, this is the colony of baboons, and it's really an extraordinary place because you see the baboons are essentially free roaming in a large area. Um, but you see these booths at any time, 24 hours a day, any monkey can enter uh, these booths. And they will find a little computer waiting for them with a touch screen. The computer will recognize which baboon is entering. And uh, they will essentially be able to play video games whenever they like. And some baboons actually like to enter at two in the night when the others are quiet and do their little video gaming. It's very addictive for them. So what's beautiful about this setup is that you can train monkeys in a pretty natural setting uh, with thousands of trials. They typically get 1,000 1, trials per day which is necessary to train these animals, give them a little education, if you will. Um, so uh, Matthias uh, Sable-Meyer, uh, for his PhD with Joel Fago and myself, uh, did uh, this in Baboon. He trained them to do the intruder task. And he trained them, of course, initially without geometry, just with this sort of pictures. Pick the intruder. Very simple. The baboons could do that. Um, then he trained them with all of these shapes here. One is the intruder, the other is the standard shape. So there's five of this and maybe one deviant like this. And for uh, most of these pairs, the baboons were excellent. They understood the intruder task. And we could also show that they understood the intruder task because we could generalize, they could generalize to these novel shapes. They uh, could pick up, for instance, um, uh, W uh, in the middle of Bs, okay? Or color yellow in the middle of color blue, something like that. Once we were sure that they understood this intruder task, we ask, could they do the geometry task? And this is the result. On top, you have the humans. I'm reminding you of this huge effect. Squares and rectangles, very easy. Irregular, very hard. There is absolutely no such effect in the baboons. 
they could not care less whether it's a square or rectangle or irregular. You see, they, they do better than chance. Chance would be a little bit here. So this is the number of errors. They do a lot of errors, but chance would be one in six uh, or five errors out of six. And they do a bit better than that. And they also improve. So the, we are talking about thousands of trials here where they get trained, they get feedback, they get a reward, and uh, they do improve. And they get to about 50% correct, which is much better than chance. So they don't do randomly, but they have no regularity effect whatsoever. Um, they don't seem to make much of a difference between the square and the irregular shapes here. They don't pick up that this one is regular and you can use the regularity to decide whether there is an intruder or not. So very, very different uh, from humans. Um, and maybe this is a little bit complicated, but I'll try to explain in a simple manner. The baboons did not behave randomly. And we found that we could explain the baboons behavior, uh, as you can see from this regression here, by what is called a convolutional neural network, an artificial intelligence model of what happens in their visual cortex. We all have the same visual cortex, uh, roughly speaking, among non-human and human primates, and it can be modeled by a series of stages of processing information. That's how we recognize faces, for instance, or objects. So we just fed the shapes through the same network that's been found to be a good model of the visual cortex of non-human and human primates for recognizing faces and objects. And essentially, we feed each of these shapes as if it was a face, and we ask which is the most different according to this network. This was an excellent predictor of the baboons. So the baboons essentially behaved as if these shapes were objects or faces. But the key point is that humans were different. In order to capture the human behavior, once again, we had to postulate a symbolic model, a sort of symbolic language where we list the properties. We list the number of right angles, the number of equal sides, equal angles, and so on. And when we list all of these properties, we can explain why humans find it easier to process squares uh, compared to irregular shapes. And I hope you can see on the left here, all of the baboons have similar responses and all of the humans have similar responses. And the humans are similar to the symbolic model, the baboons are similar to the neural network model. So our conclusion here is that there are two strategies for this task. You can just open your eyes, treat the shape, as you would an object or a face or a scene. And um, this is what the baboons do. But only the humans seem to be able to do something else. You can look at the square and decide, oh, there is something logical here. There's a structure. The structure is that the sides are equal and the angles are equal. Uh, and there's four of them. And this is something that only humans do. And if you notice now the himbas and the preschoolers, the uneducated people, they have a mixture of the two strategies. Um, they seem to be using a little bit of both, but crucially, unlike any of the baboons, they are using the symbolic model on some of the trials on some of the shapes at least. So they have, they have the beginning of an understanding that the shapes are regular uh, when they are squares and rectangles, just like we find in the Lascaux cave. So we are playing a lot with these ideas now. Uh, there is something very interesting here. It's a challenge to AI, right? Even the best AI networks, we tested a lot of these AI networks, they match the baboons, but they don't match the humans. And uh, this is a very interesting uh, thing. There is a lot of uh, competition on the internet to find uh, the most silly errors that uh, these convolutional neural networks make. Um, I think at NYU in particular, many of you are aware that there is a strong critique of these artificial neural networks. Maybe they capture a little bit what we do with faces, but they don't capture very well at all what we do with geometry or with symbols. And this is a great example. I hope you've recognized what this is, right? This is the door of a fridge with eggs. This is a relatively unfamiliar image, but you know, no ambiguity. This was classified by uh, an artificial neural network, uh, and a very good one, as 99% confident that these are ping pong balls. Right. Very silly error, but what's the root of the error? The texture may be one of ping pong balls, but the shape is completely wrong. And the network, just like the baboons, does not seem to care whether it's a perfect sphere, like a ping pong ball, or whether it's an egg shape. Um, I'm using this as a funny example, but there's a lot of research showing that this notion of a language of geometry is not well captured 
by current artificial intelligence. Um, we really need a sort of combinatorial symbolic system, which currently is a little bit hard to model with um, current artificial neural networks. Um, we are also scanning subjects with these geometrical shapes, and I, I'm showing this also for Molly, who is excited by the latest results. Um, we find that compared to all sorts of other displays, such as faces or objects or houses, which typically activate the visual ventral pathway of the brain. So you can see this is the bottom of the brain here, and on both sides, you have these visual areas that care about these sort of shapes. Well, geometrical shapes um, escape some of these network, and, and uh, on the contrary, they again activate very strongly the intraparietal sulcus. You can see in red here, in the right hemisphere of adults, and a little bit on the left, and also even in six-year-olds. So we believe that once again, uh, this is evidence that there is a sort of mental mathematical network uh, that um, encodes number as well as geometrical shapes. Um, just to give you an idea of where we are going with this, um, quadrilaterals are one thing, but we really would like to explain the uh, universal presence of shapes, which are not just restricted to quadrilateral, like in Lascaux, but they also involve lines of dots, spirals, connections between these objects. Uh, for instance, you can find a square of circles. So we've been designing, and this is a very, very recent uh, publication, it's just out now, it's no longer in revision. We found that we can propose a very simple language that accounts for all of these shapes that humans have been producing. The language has number, the language has a sense of geometry. It can move and turn and trace a little bit like the logo language. Um, and it has control structures to repeat, to concatenate, or to call subprograms. And with this extremely simple set of primitives, we can account for all sorts of shapes that have been attested across cultures. We can order them. So we claim that this is the simplest possible concept for humans, the straight line. Circle comes next spiral is just next, or dotted lines. And then if you go down this list, you can see many of these shapes that are tested among human cultures, uh, but less and less likely to be observed in one particular culture because they are more and more complex. Um, and uh, this language allows us to explain why some cultures focus on some shapes, uh, for instance, square shapes here that we've called a uh, little bit uh, exaggeratingly the Greek style of culture, and other cultures may focus on curved shapes, but both of these types of shapes can be uh, obtained by our language. And it's easy to see how the network could become biased to produce a grammar uh, with more of the left side shapes or more of the right side shapes. So we have a notion both of a universal language, but a language which creates such an explosion of possibilities that each culture has to specialize, cannot explore the whole set of possibilities. And uh, this may explain why there is variability across cultures as well as universals in human cognition for geometry. Um, so I think I'll come to my conclusions. It's been a long talk already, um, but uh, just to summarize. First of all, uh, I mean, we are, non, we are primates. We inherit from our evolution a lot of basic fundamental concepts of number and space, but we have something more. And I hope I convince you that there are some sharp differences. We possess a capacity for symbolic thought. This means that we are able to discretize the concepts of number, of space, and we are able to combine them together. And this is what I mean by a mental language of geometry. We have thoughts that are combinatorial in nature that no other animal, if I am right, uh, is able to have. No other animal is able to have the concept of a square. We have the concept of a square because we are able to formulate thoughts such as a shape with four sides that are equal and four angles that are equal. And this language allows us to discretize the concepts, to have very precise notions of true or false to assign symbols that compose and therefore to create a whole pyramid of learning mathematics, all the way to very high level concepts. Um, 
The view that I'm proposing here can explain a number of interesting things. First, it can explain why we all consider the same expressions as simple. We have the same language. All members of the human species have the same inner language of thought. And this may explain why there is so much convergence in mathematics. We all agree about the truth of mathematics by and large for I would say 99.99% .99 of mathematical concepts. And there's a lot of cross-cultural convergence. For instance, this is the so-called Pascal triangle, but it's been found quite independently by Chinese mathematicians. Um, this is because this is a very simple structure that we can single out uh, by using the same language. The second thing is that the space of possible concepts in this view is exponentially large. So the space of mathematics is enormous and we keep exploring it. We can generate infinitely many concepts. And this may explain why there is suddenly with the emergence of humans on earth, an extraordinary expansion of representational abilities. Language is exponential. It allows us to have an exponential number of concepts. Some of these concepts are crazy. So by making the so-called infinite use of finite means, we can create chimeras. There's nothing simpler. And I think all human cultures have these sort of combinatorial concepts that are crazy. Nobody has ever seen an animal, which is a mixture of a lion and a deer. Nobody has seen a snake with seven heads. But I just gave you the formula for it. It's a very simple expression. If you have language, you can combine concepts and conceive of a snake with seven heads. And um, this is a nice poster that I, I like to use. Uh, it's from a demonstration against Trump, uh, maybe in New York, I think. Um, and uh, it shows you uh, alternative facts are imaginary, of course. Um, but you see the square root of minus one here. This is one of the basic concepts of mathematics. How could we conceive of the square root of minus one? Um, it's bizarre. It's a very strange concept. And normally, you could not take the square root of a negative number. But as an expression in the language of thought, it's very simple. It's just a combination of a few symbols. And we found that this combination, maybe unlike the idea of the snake with seven heads, was actually very useful in mathematics. So the human has this capacity to project an extraordinary number of concepts. And some of them in mathematics are found to be useful. And these are the ones that we keep. Um, and uh, square root of minus one is one of them. Uh, of course, there are many other concepts that we can think of, including religious concepts. And I just want to conclude by saying that um, this sort of view of the human cultural explosion, first of all, may bridge between human biology and human culture but also may explain why there is a diversity of cultures. The space is so large that we cannot explore, exploit all of these possible concepts. And maybe language and culture act as catalysts that bring together a specific set of content, concepts and help children focus their attention and learning resources on these constructs that are deemed relevant in a given culture. And this is what we do, I think, when we train ourselves to become mathematicians. We learn that there are specific combinations of our existing concepts that are useful. Square is very useful. Uh, square root of minus one is a useful concept. And we focus on these. And of course, each mathematician ultimately focuses on a limited number of these constructions. Um, with that, I would like to close. I will show you this joke from the New Yorker from, uh, I think, a few years ago, where you see this prehistoric man looking at animals and saying, we have to record this or no one's going to believe us. Um, I think there's something very true about this. We see the world, we project onto the world a geometrical vision. And that's why we have these beautiful cave paintings that I started with in the Lascaux cave. We impose on the world, thanks to the structure of our brain, an abstraction, um, a language of geometry. Um, these are, whoops, well, I'm sorry, the people who did the work actually won't appear on the screen. Uh, let me try again. Here they are. Um, especially uh, Matthias Sablemeyer, who did his PhD on, on this, Fosca, Samuel, Marie, Lipping, uh, they're all the young people who did the work. Thank you very much for your attention. Hello, hello. Can Thank you, you very me? much, Dan. Yes, we, we're still here. Just giving people Good. a second. <laughs> that was a lovely talk. Thank you. Um, we can...
open it up for some questions if that works for you, Stan. I'll call on somebody and then you can go ahead and unmute yourself and, and uh, pose your question to Stan. So I see Ned's hand up. Go ahead, Ned. Uh, hi, Stan. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, that was that was really a brilliant talk. I'm I'm extremely impressed with Thank his you. work. I really think it's fantastic. But uh, there is a puzzle uh, to me, which is that um, the intraparietal sulcus, uh, which you point out, shows these language-like features, also um, has uh, iconic aspects, uh, some of which you yourself have demonstrated. Uh, for example, in showing that um, it, you're faster in saying that nine is larger than five than you are in saying that eight is larger than five. Um, and that seems to be based in iconic features of the of this uh, brain area. So I, I'm wondering if this one brain area has both kinds, both language-like and iconic mm -hmm. aspects, and maybe the the baboons have just the iconic aspect, and we have both. Is that the idea? Um, I I wouldn't call it iconic. I think the correct word is analogical. Is yeah, it, I, mean, I mean, I mean, yeah. I, I meant that. I meant that. Yeah, it's not really an image. It's really much more abstract than that. It's a sort of linear structure that, yeah. that you apply to number. Um, so, uh, but this is a very interesting question. First of all, uh, the intraparietal sulcus is very large. It's a huge uh, piece of cortex, very deep as well. So undoubtedly, there are, there are multiple structures in there. And the real important work to do is to do these experiments in single subjects to really look carefully at whether the same exact voxels are being activated by different conditions. I have no doubt that the system will be further separated into sub-regions. Um, still, uh, it's amazing that you can have overlapping representations for abstract mathematical concepts and for much more concrete, let's say, sets of objects and the number of a set of objects. I, um, I don't think we fully understand that. But um, I will be teaching actually at Collège de France on this topic this year. I think there's a very interesting possibility, which is that you have uh, millions or probably hundreds of millions of neurons in this area. It forms a hundred million dimensional vector space for which, with which you, have, you can code your thoughts. And maybe what's happening is that some of these dimensions are used first to code for basic number. And then more and more of these additional dimensions of this huge space are being used uh, to code for abstract concepts. Um, we don't really understand how a language is encoded by neurons, to be fair. This is really uh, a hot area of research at the moment, but we don't understand. But, <clears throat> but this would be my guess, that there is a differentiation in the coding axis. And some of them remain very basic and intuitive, like basic numerosity, and others become coding for more abstract dimensions. So your your answer is that it's basically a combinatorial system, but in the, a multi-dimensional combinatorial system, but that if you focus on just one dimension, you get analo an analogical behavior. Yes. Is that the idea? Yes, very cool. much so. Yeah. Very cool. I, 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 I'm just so filled with admiration for this stuff. It's really interesting. Thank you. Okay, we see a hand from Barbara, please. Uh, thank you, Stan. Uh, that was brilliant and inspiring as usual. So I have lots of thoughts. Here's one. You had that table of shapes and you began with a line. You could have begun with a point and mm -hmm. instead of a line. Um, and a point could be zero dimensional a yes, could be one dimension. A point could also be something you see on the ground, and a line could be something you see on the ground, like a path. So there is that multiple meanings there, and I wonder what you make of that. Um, one more point: I can uh -huh. use a line to create shapes, and your shapes were all outlines created in some sense by or could be created by moving lines so again a set of thoughts perhaps you can comment on do we still have you stan are you oh. i 
think he's frozen. Oh, your video went black. Mm -hmm. All right, let's see. We'll give him a second. While we're waiting, if anybody has any questions for Molly, feel free to raise your hand or type those in the chat. Looks like Stan may have dropped off. I'm sure he'll jump back on. Hopefully he'll jump back on. I hate to think that I've killed it. <laughs> I think it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I do see a question for you, Molly. Uh, somebody's asking that you describe your lab and what you study. Absolutely. Um, so I'll fill the time here with a little bit about my lab. So I'm interested in the origins and development of human knowledge. And uh, one area of research in my lab focuses on the origins and development of spatial understanding, in particular, the spatial understanding that might support geometric reasoning. But I'm not going to take any more time because I see Stan is I'm back. Not. So I'm sorry. Him... I don't know what happened. Yeah. Um, uh, no problem, Stan. Uh, did, were you able to hear Barbara's question? I, I heard the beginning of it, uh, and then it suddenly stopped. But I, I wanted to say that I really like the idea that on this diagram that I showed you, uh, the zero, zero order concept is the point. Right? And this is really the spirit of this language. You, you, we start with the ability to locate a certain place uh, in space, a coordinate, and there is a sense of one point. Then we have the line, then we have the circle, then we have the spiral. I did not go into much detail of this language, but we have to assume that um, there is uh, in the mind not only a sense of repetition by discrete number, but there is also a sense of repetition with continuous variation. So the spiral is a very interesting concept because you need to be able to trace, but you say, well, first to do a circle, you say, I trace, but I'm going to turn by a fixed amount, and you get a circle. Then if you say, I trace, but I turn by a certain amount, but I accelerate, I get a spiral. So we are led to the hypothesis that there is this ability, basically at the basics uh, of this language, is the ability to repeat with variations that are both discrete, you get these four loops, or continuous. And um, I like the idea that the basics of mathematics is a sense of repetition with variation, which is essentially symmetry. When I symmetry, we mean that it's something that repeats, but yet there was also uh, an operation that was applied to it. So uh, essentially my proposal is that at the heart of mathematics is the sense of symmetry or repetition. And I see other questions, but I think you should decide who can ask them. I think Van, I think your hand was up next. Yeah, hi. Oh, this whole thing is just wonderful. I'm fascinated by it. Um, I, I'm looking at data that has to do with a test that's very similar to a, to what you just showed in terms of distinguishing tonal sequences. And this data I'm looking at is looking at musicians and non-musicians, but it also um, has the uh, has the male female uh, thing available to me for me to for me to look at and the, the males when they're not musicians are showing something that males often show which is greater greater variability across mm -hmm. males and as they become trained musicians that seems to go away and and um this this mm -hmm. variability is much more similar once you're talking about trained musicians so i'm wondering about any of these uh interesting patterns and whether there might be any differences between males and females no, thank you. Maybe you can paste the specific reference you're looking at, because I'm not sure I know this study. But I can speak a little bit about uh, males versus females in mathematics. All of the cognitive research suggests Oh, we lost your, oh, you're back. OK, we lost your audio for a second, Stan. Oh, damn. I'm sorry. Maybe I, I moved to my phone because I think the building's internet has become unstable, but maybe this is worse. Oh, you're good. Okay, okay good. Um, so I, I was saying that all of the cognitive science work suggests that at birth, and probably for the first few years, there is no difference whatsoever between males and females in these circuits. 
Um, we have actually incredible data from France because in France, every single child is being tested at the beginning of first grade, middle of first grade, and beginning of second grade. And we are about to submit this paper where we have 2 million children, basically, we have that over three years. And the data is that at the beginning of first grade, there's no difference whatsoever, except for the one you were just saying. So there's more dispersion in the males. So the mean is the same. There's a bit more dispersion in the males. Um, but after four months of school, we begin to see a strong advantage of boys. And after one year of school, it's a huge advantage for boys. And so this research and a lot of additional research suggests that the, the differences that we see are, in a certain sense, culturally driven. Uh, the girls that enter school somehow are led to believe that this is not for them. Mathematics is not for most of them. And they quit and they don't make the effort, which is necessary for all of us. All of this requires you know, effort to acquire mathematics. So this is, this is, I think, the dominant view at the moment. I wouldn't say that there is zero difference, but there's very little difference if there is one. And um, the, 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 the strengths of education in changing whatever differences there are um, is huge. Uh, I think this was also implicit in your question. If you get musical education, you build these structures in a way which completely overrides uh, any small differences that they might exist at the beginning. Thank you. Okay, we have a question from Danielle. Please go ahead. And I see Mark also. Hi, Mark. Hi, my son is wondering if you've ever done research on triangles. Triangles? Uh, not yet, <laughs> but Molly has. Actually, I did. I, I, I did some of it with Veronique Izar. Um, and um, the intuitions of triangles are extraordinary also. Um, people have the intuitions that uh, the sum of the three angles of a triangle should be, uh, should be pi, or 180 degrees. And we have this rather extraordinary experiment also, uh, which is what happens if you describe to people that the triangles do not live on a flat surface, but they live on a sphere? So we actually did this in the Amazon. It's a crazy experiment. We wanted to teach non-Euclidean geometry or spherical geometry in the Amazon. So we described to these people in the Amazon this place, which is either completely flat and where there are little villages and straight roads from one village to the next, or that would be the Euclidean plain. But in another part of the experiment, we also describe them this different place where it's all round. And we show them a ball and we say, well, there are also little villages on it. And there are little roads that go from one village to the next. And just each change of context was uh, changed completely the intuitions of these people. In the first case, they are Euclidean uh, intuitions. In the second case, they are non-Euclidean intuitions. And in the first case, they saw that the sum of three angles was pi. And in the second case, they saw that the sum of triangles could be different from pi, could be larger, and so on. All of the intuitions uh, that Euclid had 2,000 years ago, they seem to have at least the start of them. Thank you. Um, Mark Mitten. Hi, Stan. Good to see you. That was a great, amazing talk. Thank you. And um, my... my uh, my brain lit up when you talked about symmetry, because when I studied with those old master magicians for years and years, symmetry actually was at the base of everything they taught me. In other words, if you broke your symmetry, people were aware. And if you, you went through elaborate actions to not break your symmetry, then people were much less aware. It, it no. was a basic triggering mechanism. Mm -hmm. So that really sounds right. Then I'm also wondering how you test these percepts and, and memories in in action. And then of course, action then is related to asymmetric information conditions, right? And then that's the second question. And there's a third, which just came up. Um, I was lucky enough to have Thanksgiving dinner with Joe Cohn, the great Princeton mathematician, and his grandson was there fidgeting with the Rubik's cube. So I made a conjecture to him. I said, so what's more useful in the end, thinking or fidgeting? When you're mm -hmm. thinking about the Riemann hypothesis late at night, are you doing that? And I pointed to his 17-year-old grand, grandson, you know, mixing up the Rubik's Cube. And he said, yeah, I th think I'm doing something more like that. Mm -hmm. In other words, you know, in, in Jerry Edelman terms, like a selective process mm -hmm. over a purposeful directed process. Mm -hmm. 
Well, that's a difficult question. Um, the networks that we see in the brain are not directly involved in action, but they are not far uh, yeah. from the networks that are involved in action. Uh, for instance, you might have seen that not only there is the anterior intraparietal cortex, but there's also the premotor cortex on both sides. And uh, this is really just in front of the motor cortex. It's a bit more abstract. So we think that we are seeing abstract programs that can be realized in action, like when you draw a square, but also um, in perception. And they are common to perception and to production of the same shapes. Um, but it's a very likely that what changed in uh, hominization of the brain um, also allowed us to have a much more refined sense of the actions that are available. And uh, tool use and tool making is, of course, one of the defining uh, aspects of our species. Uh, I believe, in the end, it boils down to something similar, which is the ability to have languages, and I already speak in the plural, including a language of action that allows us to create composite tools, for instance, by having um, you know, a whole grammar of action. We are still at the very beginning of parsing all of these different languages in the brain. So I cannot quite tell you if action and mass would really activate very overlapping areas. This is for the future. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks. We have another Mark with his hand up. I guess that's me. Um, yeah, I think so. Does the, does the fact that these this symbolic facility seems to be universal in humans and absolutely not in our primate relatives um, suggest that this arose evolutionary evolutionarily either in a very compressed time frame or that it had an incredibly powerful positive selective uh, ability yeah a great question I, I i don't think we know and it's very very hard to get data to have the answer um, so my, my current thinking is that it's not just a change in one brain area, it's a change in several brain circuits, because we have also natural language. Um, <clears throat> even inside natural language, there are multiple sub-networks that all seem to have this combinatorial ability. Um, so my feeling is that multiple networks had to change. Now, one possibility is that there was some kind of mutation that changed them all at the same time and they acquired some kind of recursive ability. Another possibility, which perhaps is a little bit more likely, is that it's first a conceptual system, maybe this mathematical system that I described, which changed first. And <clears throat> when you see bifaces, you know, 1.8 million years ago, there's already a very strong sense of geometry and something completely unique to humans at a moment where cultural evolution is still very slow suggesting that maybe there was no uh, language as a linkage for culture. So I, I have speculated in one chapter that maybe the first thing that changed is the conceptual system with this ability to have a combinatorial language. And then it became useful to share that with others. And we developed language as a communication device. That's a, a lot of speculations, very, very hard to know. And I hope we'll have the answer one day, but uh, for the moment, there is, there is no data. Thank you. And a great talk besides. Thanks a lot. We have one question that was posed in the chat um, by Alex. If you don't mind, I'll read it. Um, preschool favors geometry as neat and sequential, but organic shapes in nature, not a similar set of core patterns. Don't children need a visual language of thought of both geometric and organic shapes to see the world and imagine new things? What about the commonality of organic shapes with humans and animals? Hmm. Uh, that's an interesting question. I mean, if we mean by organic shapes, the shapes of animals or the shapes of trees, the, the scenes that we see, um, the human and animal systems uh, seem to be rather similar. Uh, we have dedicated areas for faces, in human and non-human primates. We have areas for places. For vegetation, we know much less. And it's an interesting topic because there are three structures there and abstractions maybe. But um, my bet is that there is a whole common organization to the ventral system, but then we bring symbolization on top of that. Yeah. Um, and um, what we do in preschool interests me a lot 
Um, we are starting to do studies now in preschools, uh, also in an educational context. I love the idea that many of the activities which are described as artsy, artistic, are actually preparing for math. Um, and uh, whether it is in the domain of graphic arts or music, I think what we are doing is we're preparing children with structures. So uh, I am very struck that, uh, well, you mentioned organic shapes, but when, when uh, young children draw, let's say, a face or a tree, they don't draw a face or a tree. They draw the abstract geometrical structure of the face or the tree. They are incredibly abstract, actually. And, you know, we make a little bit of fun of how funny it is because it doesn't really look like a very real face or a real person. Uh, maybe the arms are attached to the face. But uh, overall, the geometrical structure, the abstract tree structure is well preserved in children's drawing. So my feeling is that um, very early on, um, we move beyond what you could call the organic or the picture and we go to the abstract geometrical structure, and that's very unique to humans. Great, and we'll do, let's do one last question I see in the chat. Uh, do This is from Crystal. Do math and music share neural circuits? What is seen on fMRI? Okay, so we don't know so much. Uh, we What you really need to do is scan the very same subjects uh, with both paradigms, and this has not been done uh, as far as I know. Um, and it needs to be done within single persons, not at the group level. So you're really sure that it's the same exact circuit. So this experiment has not been done yet. What we see is roughly the same circuits, especially in the anterior part of the intraparietal circles. So I think that this is this might be where the number system kicks in in music. And you have these four loops and loops inside loops that is common to language of music and language of geometry. What is very clear uh, at least in some experiments, is that uh, natural language does not overlap much with music, if at all. There are some nice experiments. Nowadays, this, this, this exact experiment has been done well, by, in particular by F. Fedorenko at MIT. And uh, she finds that there is essentially no overlap in the sense that if you pick up voxels that are specialized for language, they don't react to music at all. Um, and this is a correction to what we used to think. At a coarser resolution, it looked like the same circuit. But when you zoom in, you find that, in fact, it's not at all the same circuit. So I think it fits with the idea I defended in the talk that there's a sort of general logic of languages, but there are multiple languages. Um, and we know, for instance, in the case of music, we know that you can lose language, become severely aphasic and agrammatic, and keep music and keep mathematics as well. Um, I don't know if there are cases of people who lost music and kept their mathematics or vice versa. Uh, this is much less studied. So this will be an interesting topic for our future research, basically. All right. Thank you, Stan. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. I have a couple of parting words. If you'd like to see more of Stan's work, you can please feel free to check out his uh, one of his most recent books, How We Learn, that's the English title. You can also, as he mentioned, attend his upcoming course, Au Collège de France. Uh, the course is called Vector Codes and the Geometry of Mental Representations. And the complimentary seminar is Mechanisms of Mathematical Intuition in Humans and Machines. And the slides for both of these will be presented in English. And you can find the access to those courses on um, the college's website. Finally, I'm happy to announce our next Minds on Math event, which will welcome Dr. Allison Gopnik from the University of California, Berkeley. And Allison will join us in person at the museum on Wednesday, January 25th at 6 p.m. Eastern time. So please look out for further details about registration for this event. Thank you again to Stan for this incredible presentation, for the audience members here today for your participation, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Molly, as well. It's been a wonderful collaboration and uh, very happy to get to meet Stan and bring what I think was a fabulous program to everyone as a lunch and learn here in New York. So maybe we'll do more of these. I saw everybody's responses. Thank you. And enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks. I would love to visit you in New York one day. Thanks. Well, so you have an open invitation. You and as many grandchildren as you decide to have by then. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>